Ron Herndon, director of Albina Head Start, is an educator, fundraiser, administrator, organizer, and community activist. He graduated from high school and community college in Coffeyville, Kansas. Then, this was 1965, he became a VISTA volunteer for two years, beginning as a block worker, organizing a single block in East Harlem. In the summer of 67, he took a leave to conduct training for Peace Corps trainers and volunteers preparing for work in West Africa. And I think that must say something about Ron's salesmanship to convince the Peace Corps that Coffeyville in New York City qualified him as an expert on Sierra Leone. In 1968, he left New York for Portland's Reed College, from which he graduated with a BA in history. Uh, by the way, he later got that African experience as a grad student in Nigeria and Liberia. In Portland, as many in this room know, he's been a teacher, director, founder with many important organizations, too numerous to list them all. They include the Albina Youth Opportunity School, the Black United Front, the Oregon Human Rights Coalition, the Black United Fund, the Northeast Community Development Corporation, the Youth Gang Task Force, and since 1975, he's been the director of the Albina Ministerial Alliance Head Start Program. Since 1988, he's been president of the National Head Start Directors Association. He's a holder of many awards and honors for leadership and community activism. He's taught inside the ivy covered walls of Dartmouth College and inside the barbed wire of Oregon State Correctional Institution. Today, Mr. Herndon's address, he addresses two City Club premier issues, children and diversity. His topic is the permanent effects of racism, how we can protect our children. Ron Herndon. Thank you very much, uh, especially for the invitation to be here at the City Club. On the way, I was thinking, I think this is about the third time I've had an opportunity to speak at the City Club, and it always has been a pleasure. The topic of racism, when, when you try to investigate it, look at it, normally one of the first responses is most of the people in the room get a knot in their stomach. I hope that today at least we can get beyond that and really spend some time looking at causes and beyond the causes, because I don't think it takes a, a particular genius to describe problems. Most of us, if we get a decent book or listen to Larry King for two weeks in a row, we can des describe just about every social program in the world. But in terms of coming up with solutions, I think that requires a little bit more work and probably a little bit more thoughtfulness. For a definition, as far as I'm concerned, just for a working definition today to get us off and rolling, for me, as in simple terms, racism is when one group, in this particular circumstance, ethnic group, controls another group and is able to enforce its will, its standard, its culture, and its mores on the other ethnic group in force. See, that's a lot different. Some people think that, well, because you don't like a particular person who is different in some respect, that that is racism. Racism, you have to have the power, the institutions, to enforce your culture, your particular religion, your particular view of the world on another group of people. Without that, that's not racism, at least for this little working definition for this discussion. And, and aside, I don't want anyone to leave here today thinking that I have suggested that racism is the only major problem confronting this country. By no means. There are several. I mean, we could spend hours not only talking about racism, but equally we could talk about anti-Semitism, which I don't think receives enough discussion at all anymore. And as another aside, I still would like to see something that listed the number of Jews that are on the boards of banks here in Portland. Then maybe we could really have a little discussion about anti-Semitism. Uh, sexism. There are a number of areas that are of seminal importance to this country. Racism is but one, but that's the one we're going to talk about. So I've given a working definition. Then somebody inevitably asks, don't you think there has been a lot of improvement made in race relations? There may have been in race relations, but in racism, no. Racism is very much a permanent part of this country, and unfortunately, I agree with Derek Bell, I think it will be for the foreseeable future. Why? Because those in leadership positions in this country have not made any kind of long-standing effort to eradicate racism. Has not been done. 
No one has said that racism is agenda item number one for the country, and we are going to work to eradicate it. Have there been laws passed? Yes. Passing laws and changing a culture are two completely different things. Racism is very much a part of the culture, very much a part of the fabric of this country. Changing laws does not change culture. If that was a fact, then there should not be sexism in this country, because most certainly laws have been changed that, for the most part, say that it is illegal. But most certainly, it is still very much a part of this country. So I think that people need to separate what has happened in the legal system, what has happened constitutionally from what is very much a part of the American culture. Two forms of racism, and I'll try to get through the, the, the definitions very quickly. Individual and institutional. Individual probably in its most pathological form would have been the attack of the skinheads on Mula Geta Sarai, probably one of those pathological forms of racism. Individuals who have adopted this uh, this view of the world and have decided that anybody who happens to be black and in an unprotected circumstances is to be treated as game, something to be hunted, something to be injured, something to maim, to be maimed, somebody to be killed. Personally, I think far more insidious and far more damaging than individual racism is institutional racism. Individuals come and go, institutions are permanent. What do I mean by institutional racism? Racism as evidenced by public schools, by businesses, by churches, by lending institutions, by housing institutions, by political bodies, by health care organizations. I think that form of racism is far more damaging and destructive because it affects so many more people. And it affects them on a daily basis. Evidence of that, 1992, still in this country, you have an infant mortality rate in the black community that is the same and worse than many third world countries. Third world countries. Low birth weights among children born in this country, again, black children specifically, worse than many third world countries. Now, I'm sure all of us sitting here today that when you hear statistics like that, you say, isn't it horrible? And how could it be? Well, it, it's not a surprise. It's not new. It has been and, and has continued for years and years and years and years. You have more black men in jail, percentage-wise, in America than you do South Africa. Oh, Jesus, how could that be? That's terrible. That's horrible. You have more black men in prison than you do in college. Oh, how could that be? How could that be? It's institutional racism. You design a system a certain way, it rewards certain people, it punishes other people. By the way, another topic that doesn't receive a great deal of discussion is how the country responds to poor white people. Not much different. The only difference is, because of racism, the way the country works and the myth has been, and it has worked, I don't care how poor I get, if I'm white, I'm still better than black folks. Now, that has a social value in this country. It has been very practical for this country. And I would submit, were it not for racism in this country, you would have had far more social disruption on the part of poor and lower income white people than you have had historically. The reason that hasn't occurred is because of, I think there was one of the old line Southern politicians, was it Henry Clay, I'll take him for instance, Call, he, he called it the mud seal theory. Then he had, this has actually been articulated. He called it the mud seal theory. Mud seal being sort of like the foundation in the old days. It was a mud seal they used as a foundation for buildings. They said he said black people. Uh, his his term was not as flattering as that, but we're in, in uh, genteel co company here. Said black people <clears throat> were the mud seal for white society because every white person knew that no matter how bad their circumstances, they could never be as bad off as black people. Now, he wasn't just talking about economically. He was talking about culturally, psychologically. You knew that it couldn't get so bad that you were as bad off as black people. And you say, well, how is that helpful? Very, very, very helpful. Because when you begin to inevitably confront these social issues, 
you need some way to explain them. What better way to explain them than say, oh, it's the black folks' problem. Don't believe me? I suggested this the other week, still today in this country. If you say welfare, what's the image that jumps in your mind? Most people, probably this room excluded, most people, when you say welfare, they think of a black woman, black woman, rather, with 100 kids. I mean, that's the image that jumps in people's mind. And I was rather disappointed even our current president starts talking about welfare reform. Well, the Welfare Reform Act was passed in 1988. Welfare has been reformed. Why does that become an issue? The laws are on the book that if you have children and their ages are such and such, here are certain things you have to do. It is an emotional issue that will appeal to a certain audience, and unfortunately, certain erroneous images jump into people's minds when you say that. When you start talking about problems in the cities, crime, when you think about crime, what's the first image? Not with all people, but unfortunately with too many people, black people, street crime. Most of the money that's lost in this country because of crime is due to white collar crime. I'm not familiar with very many black people who are in the jails of this country today that were involved in the savings and loan scandal. I'm not. Maybe you know them. I don't. I'm not familiar with very many black folks who are in Oregon State Penitentiary who were involved in the defense scandal. Maybe you know them. I don't. I'm not familiar with too many black folks that were involved in the junk bond scandal. I didn't see too many brothers going to jail with Michael Milken. <laughs> Maybe I missed the news that night. <laughs> and these are major issues that people say are one of the reasons the economy of this country is so messed up. But if you ask people, say, what's the problem? We wasted all that money on those poverty programs, that doggone affirmative action program. They got these things that they don't need. My point is this, racism has a social value in this country. And I would submit to you the reason that the gap between rich and poor in America is greater than any other industrialized country, greater than any other industrialized country, is because of racism. Because poor white people can always be told, I don't care how poor you are, you're better off than black people, and these problems that you see around you, like you can't get a job, you can't get a house finance, you can't send your kid to college, a lot of those problems center around black people. It's not a nice thing to say in polite company, but I still believe that that very much is a part of the fabric of this country. Step back just a moment. The maddening part of this, intellectually, is absolutely no basis for racism. And in this discussion, we're talking about racism as it is played out in America. For those people who dabble around in history, I'm sure that you are very well aware that the individual who is called the father of history, Herodotus, Herodotus in some circles, that when he described Egypt, he said the Egyptians, quote, are black and have woolly hair. That's the father of history. That little quote does not make it into too many books. Most certainly books that are used to educate children. And the reference on that, and I always say that when you throw quotes around, you should at least have your reference. Herodotus, book two of history. That's where you can find it. And what does that mean? Well, now, this throws a little different light on some of these assumptions about black people not having any culture or history until they were brought here, until they crossed the Atlantic and learned how to play basketball and develop the blues. Until then, they didn't have much history, right? <clears throat> uh, now we're talking about Egypt. We're talking about one of the first civilizations known to the world. We're talking about the mathematical foundation of the world. We're talking about one of the first linguistic systems. We're talking about science. We're talking about astronomy. We're talking about the arts. Now, what foundation can racism stand on when we teach people that history and then turn around and say, well, you can't expect them to do much better. Or that's why they're behind. They've always been behind. The challenge, and especially with children, I think first, as a nation, we have to determine and decide if we want to eradicate racism. I don't think the nation has decided that. I don't. I've heard all the proclamations, racist free zones, and all that other stuff, right? I've heard that. 
but in terms of behavior matching the action. Or as they used to say, the walk matching the talk. Absolutely have not seen it. Do school systems really want to eradicate racism? I haven't seen it, including the one here. I know people say, oh, I'm, I hate racism. It's horrible. It's not something that, that I subscribe to. I don't let my children use the wrong N-word. And anybody using the wrong N-word, I tell them, don't associate with them, all that. But when you begin to say, OK, if that's what you believe in, what are we doing to change the way in which the institution functions? How do we ensure that every child, not just black children, because this is just as destructive to white children, because their view of the world becomes very warped. Their view of people becomes very warped. And you end up turning children. And that was, a sh that was the, uh, to me, the tragedy of what happened to Mulugeta Sarah. Obviously, what happened to him and the pain that it caused him and his family, but the young men who were involved in killing him, said that they did not hit Portland from Mars. They're homegrown. What does that say about us as a city that young people can grow up here and come out of a school system, come out of a society, come out of a community, come out of a neighborhood with notions like that? And we're not talking about 1940. We're not talking about 1930. We're talking about the 19. 80s. I don't think we should be surprised because we have not, as adults, done what we should have done to make sure that our young people get information that would almost prevent that from occurring. Yes, I know there, were, well, there was Cain and Abel and this kind of crime has always been around, but not for that reason. What do you do, specifically in terms of schools? Make sure that children really learn about the history and culture of other people and not just during Black History Month, right? Not just on Martin Luther King's birthday and not just during Brotherhood Week. And when they learn it, it's not as if we're looking at, oh, look at the savages over there. Now, these are the mores of the savages. Don't they have these cute little dances? And please quit referring to their dress as costumes. Aren't those nice costumes they have? Oh, aren't those different costumes they have? And next step, please, when you look at their different ethnic groups, I still hear this and it cracks me up, referring to them as tribes. And if they get to fighting, if three spears are thrown, it's a tribal war, right? <laughs> now, I have yet to hear anybody describe what's occurring in Yugoslavia as tribal warfare. What's the difference? You tell me the difference. If it's an ethnic group in Europe, it's an ethnic group in Africa, it's an ethnic group in India, it's an ethnic group in America. And when we see their communities, how come they always end up being villages? The smallest hamlet in Oregon rarely is ever called a village. I've seen communities in Africa that dwarf towns in Oregon, but when people spot them, that's a village. We're getting ready to go into the village. Well, it should be one standard linguistically. If we're going to come up with our definitions, let's keep them consistent. Why? And I had a person challenge me on it. As a matter of fact, last time I was out at, at Reed, I had a guy challenge me, uh, a classmate had gone off. He's a big professor now, very, very, very high up on the ladder. He said, well, village is a technical term, and tribe is a technical, technical term that fits these groups. I said, that's fine for academia, but let's go out here on the street and scratch the first person we see and say, where are tribes and villages located? And let's see how many of them point to Europe on the map, right? <laughs> so again, you say, well, that's a small thing. But institutionally, if you are concerned, if you are concerned about eradicating racism, get to the root belief system. One group is superior, one group is inferior. And if you know that it has been around and been a part of the fabric of this society for centuries, that is going to require work. Not one year, not two years, but decades of sustained work. And if we're serious, we will monitor what we're doing. I defy anybody to show me a class that's being taught to children that is supposed to increase their awareness of different cultures and their appreciation of different cultures. Show me a monitoring system that's in place to make sure the teacher is actually getting that information across and the children are actually learning that information. That's what we do in science. That's what we do in math. Where is the monitoring system to make sure this new information is being absorbed by children? That's what you do when you think a body of knowledge is serious. 
but institutionally we have not made that decision not only in this country we have not made it in this city we have not made it in the school system when you are concerned about changing the way or changing information that young people get that's what you do you ins you insist and you ensure that new knowledge is put in place you monitor instruction you monitor student performance. If there have to be adjustments made, you make them. That has not occurred. I suggest that some of these problems obviously go far beyond Portland. Healthcare is something that will have to be addressed and resolved nationally. But I think that there are some things that we can do in terms of addressing some of these other issues, especially as they relate to children. This past summer, and I don't want to just paint a picture of, of doom and gloom, but if we're going to understand what we're up against, I think we truly do need to understand it and understand what it's going to take for us to get out of it. Do I, and, and by the way, I do think we can get out of it, because this is one of the few countries in the world that actually does say that rhetorically we believe in, in, in a multicultural society, except I guess there are some folks who say now even that doesn't make sense because it's going to tear down the fabric of the country. You're probably familiar with the argument that's raging throughout the country among some intellectuals about teaching multiculturalism in school will somehow make these young children confused about what their roots are and if they don't know what their roots are they won't be patriotic and all this other nonsense. There are some of us I, I think who really do believe that the more children appreciate and understand other groups in this country the better off we all are, the healthier we all are. If we do believe that and we do say that we subscribe to it it has to be reflected in what we do in our institutions. One, I was going to, to address this whole issue of employment. A simple thing that was done last summer, and I see some people in the room who are involved in it. After the uh, riots in LA last summer, uh, Sam Brooks, Daryl Takufu, and, and myself got together and we said, hey, let's see if we can speed up, accelerate some of the action in town that's supposed to address some of the underlying causes. So youth employment, adult employment, and business growth and development, those are issues that the business community can do something about contacted major business leaders in the uh, city, held a meeting, and said, we want it, and this is in, we put all of this, what I'm going to describe to you, we put, we put all this together in th about three weeks. So we want to do something about youth employment. We're going to do it a little bit differently. There will not have to be any income criteria. Young folks who want to work can work. And you say, well, that's a novel idea, except when it comes to our community. What happens is that when people normally come up with employment programs for our community, they say this, you have to be almost dirt poor before you can get a job. So the programs are geared for the children who are extraordinarily poor or the children who are extraordinarily talented and go into college, but for 80% of us who are right in the middle, there are no programs to employ them. So we said this program will be for anybody who wants to go to work. We will use this agency in the community that's proven to be very good at this, and we will develop one number that people can call if they have a job. One of the most successful programs that was put together, we ended up employing almost 600 young folks last summer. 80% of them were black. Just tells the, the story, the story that's been told is, is, is certainly a lie that these kids don't want to work. Over 1,000, almost 1,500 young folks came through. All of them end up getting work permits, birth certificates, all the other paraphernalia they need to get a job. This was done in three weeks, three weeks which says to me that these problems are not insurmountable. And we even took the big step of saying, if we're really going to do something about this, let's set some goals. Because that's what you do when you're serious about resolving problems. We said our goal is, and at the table, represented were the Chamber of Commerce, Association for Portland Progress, our goal is to reduce employment in Portland, in the black community, so it's no greater than any other part of Portland. Now you're talking. That's what people do when they're serious about change. And people didn't bat an eye back up from the table. That's, our, that's how we will measure what we're going to be doing over the next several years. We will measure what we're doing. We just started to launch the same kind of effort for adult employment, same system. Had an ad agency to put together public service announcements that played this summer, and most of the kids said that's how they found out about the, the program. Either their parents or a relative heard the ad that was on the radio. That's what you do if you want to reach people. Use the airwaves. Putting up one of these lost dog flyers in the hallway at school, if you want a job, come here after school and see Miss Ugbugum, 
and bring in three pieces of ID and your mama's birth certificate and your daddy's citizenship papers and we might find a place for you. You know how many people you're going to be able to serve. That's one example that gives me hope given the people who are around the table. I think we can replicate that in every area in this city once people decide they want to do something about this issue. I don't think that decision, excuse me, I don't think that decision has been made in enough quarters of the city. That example, plus several others that I have seen, suggests to me that these problems can be solved. But it will take a major decision being made in the white community in Portland. And that might sound strange, but if you look back over the last 15 years in this city, you will have seen a proliferation of black self-help organizations that have been developed in this community. And you just heard a few of them. But I think there is more than clear evidence. There is more than the willingness in the black community to reach out and form partnerships with people who are serious about helping to develop change and create change and celebrate change. That's not where the problem is. Until the decision is made in some pretty high quarters and some pretty responsible positions that that is an agenda item that's worthy of some work, as Derek Bell says, I think that we will be having speeches like this for a long, long time. Let me say this as I, I wrap up and give some time for for uh, questions. If we can begin to use the media to uh, try to change some of these misperceptions <coughs> that I alluded to earlier, uh, programs that are set up for black people, these, are, these folks have gotten these unearned gifts. The poverty program, and I, I get so sick, I hear people talking about all that money wasted in the poverty program. So all that money? How long did it last? I think the first programs were initiated in about 1964, 65. I think by about 1970, most 72, most of them were gone. So we're talking about a seven year period and we're talking about an amount of money that was probably less than 1% of 1% of the gross national product of this country. So where did all those dollars go to? They were never there. And let's just kind of flip the equation. Let's accept the argument. The money was wasted over that seven year period. Compare that with the country's decision to put a man on the moon. Ah, you remember what happened? Those first spaceships, bloop, bloop, and very embarrassing. I mean, they went this way, looked like drunk Roman candles, went that way, right? <laughs> Couldn't get up off the launching pad had some tragedies along the way. But did someone say, well, after the first three went up, after the first two years up, we're not gonna try to compete with the Russians, that's it. We've wasted this money, no. There was a commitment, a collective commitment in this country that said, yes, this is something that is worthy of our attention and our resources. Same thing wasn't agreed to, committed to, when the so-called war on poverty was launched. That, to me, is the difference between what you do when you're serious about trying to address a national problem. Just hold up the space program, hold up the poverty program. Affirmative action. You still get these raging debates about affirmative action. We're all, you all got these laws passed as if everybody in the country was far past the laws. This is some, this is some interesting history. Maybe I'm just old enough to remember all the resentment, all the people that died to get some of these doggone laws passed. I remember editorials that were written in papers across this country when the civil rights movement was alive and well in this country, and many of them weren't very flattering. I remember seeing the New York Times talk about Martin Luther King like he stole a government mule when he came out against the war in Vietnam. Basically said, you're not qualified to talk about foreign affairs. The guy's got a doctorate degree, about to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, but you can't talk about foreign affairs. So, Maybe my collective memory is a little warped on this, but now you've got these laws, we're all equal. Why should you be given any preferences? It seems like simple justice to me. If you concoct a system that for 300 years, based upon race, keeps people back, and you basically cripple them. 
And aside on this, on the cultural part, if you don't think the crippling parts of racism are still apparent, and some people think I'm gonna be telling something out of school, if you don't think that it is still very much a part of a battle that goes on in a black psychic, go into any black community and say something about good hair or bad hair, <laughs> then y'all know what I'm talking about. That is, and for those of you who don't know, one of the things that was done during slavery and one of the byproducts of racism was to teach black people to be ashamed of their physical characteristics. That's how you dehumanize people. Ashamed of the pigment, pigmentation, ashamed of the thickness of the lips, ashamed of the width of the nose, and ashamed of the texture of the hair. Very much a part of racism. To the point that even in the black community today, in many quarters, it is assumed that hair that comes closer to looking like straight hair, and you know who has straight hair, that that's good hair. Hair that comes closer to looking like this hair, that's bad hair. And we're gonna go to great efforts to do something about this. Now if you wanna measure the depth of the sickness that is a residue of racism and slavery, that is still there, that the standard of beauty in our community is still being debated in 1992, and the standard of beauty in too many quarters ends up being white. So that's what we're up against. And I submit to you that is every bit as destructive for white people, every bit as destructive, to assume that whatever you look like should be the standard for the world, when you don't look like most of the world. Most of the world looks probably a little closer to what I look like, right? So when you come in contact with them, you will make some bad mistakes. Suggestion, in, in conclusion, begin to address some of these idiotic notions. Affirmative action, yes, it makes sense because you crippled people, kept them back to ever help them catch up. There are special things you have to do if you are fair. When children have handicapping conditions, now we have laws that say you do special things so that they can get a quality education. Do you resent that? No, you don't resent it. If you're humane, it should be done. We want everybody to be a productive citizen. We cannot afford to lose people. We can't. So if that's what's necessary to make up for mistakes we've made in the past, do it, do it quickly so we don't have to debate it. But it takes people standing up and making this argument, and it can't be just people like me coming to the black community say, oh, you got, you got vested interests, you want a job. <laughs> you know your kids ain't smart enough to compete with mine, so that's why you want that special set aside a little bit of school. And this again, excuse me for getting off the point, this is a big joke. Why should they have these special slots available for black kids to get in these colleges? We should all compete. I said, well, I haven't heard anybody complain about these guys have these football scholarships. I haven't seen too many women on the football team. Aren't those special slots set aside for a special kind of person? How about the slots that are set aside for the folks in the band, band scholarships? Don't everybody play a, a flute or, or can play that guitar like B.B. King? Doesn't that discriminate against me? I mean, that's a special slot. How about special slots for the people who are particularly gifted? See, we make these distinctions all, or how, and this is the one that we really don't want to talk about. How about special slots available for the kids of the alumni who give all that money? Can be dumb as fence posts. <laughs> I mean, dumb as fence posts, but somehow they seem to get in school. That's a special, that's, a, that's preferential treatment given to a special group of people and we see it happening every day and we think it's okay. But when we say the one group that has been kept out low on these many years, that we're going to give them special treatment to try to make up for all the mistreatment, oh no, 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 we're all supposed to be treated the same and you shouldn't have that extra leg up. Need people like the folks in this room to begin to make these arguments in places where m folks like me will never be, in boardrooms, school boards, administrative offices, and get some commitments from folks to seriously talk about change. And, and lastly, probably one of the, the most deviling parts of this <laughs> is that <clears throat> there is normally always the assumption, and, this is, and all of this is broad brush, right? I'm not trying to suggest these are, are assumptions that are held by every white person in this country. Obviously, that's not true. But collectively, that black folks still don't have quite as much sense as white folks <laughs> Now, if you don't think that's true, sit down. I know all of y'all probably got some black friends. Now, when we leave here, 
You get them off in a quiet corner and ask them, is that, do you all really think that? And listen to what people will tell you. And I'm talking about people, you would be surprised, people who work up in these corporate offices, right? And some of us who learned which fork to use, we set these three and four devilish forks down on the table to try to eat a meal, and three and four glasses to get something to drink, actually know how to do all that stuff, ask them, do you really feel that way too? We thought that you kind of come over and you understand what's going on. Yes, that you are presumed to not have as much sense as. Now I think that again is part of the culture. That's what we were all taught. We are all victims of what we have been taught. And I mean that sincerely, all of us. Those that subscribe to the notion and those that are victims of the notion. But we can all get out of it. This is not complicated. It's about re-education, re-education. Commit ourselves to do it. I'm convinced that we can. Give me an example of how it can be done. Mothers Against Drunk Driving, I think, is one of the best examples of a grassroots organization that I know of. Started by a few people at the grassroots level, have forever and a day changed the consciousness of this country about drinking and driving. That's how you do it. Commitment and work. We can do it. I hope that all, if all of us make some kind of commitment to do it and do it systematically over a long period of time, hopefully in the not too distant future, during Black History Month, there will not be someone up here describing the remnants, vestiges, and applications of racism that are current and past. We will be talking about the successes that we've made in overcoming all of that. Thank you all very, very much. questions by Joanne Allen and Nancy Stanley. We'll open up the questions to anyone from the floor, member or non-member. We have microphones set up in the audience. I'll especially encourage our representatives here, many representatives here from Portland Youth Forum to get up and uh, ask our speaker a challenging question. Joanne. I sat here and wrote three questions and Ronnie answered all of them at the end. <laughs> so I have another question. Uh, Mr. Herndon, um, there's a lot of buzzwords going around about valuing diversity and pluralism and multiculturalism and, and everybody feels real secure and real comfortable talking about how much they value the differences in people. What I'd like you to address is forget the buzzwords. What are the specifics that each individual should be responsible for to make a difference in our community? I think that we have to to uh, pick our battles. If one, we have to decide, are we gonna fight? And that's the question I don't think it's been, I, it has been answered, but not in the affirmative. I think that once we make the decision that this is an issue that is worthy of, of effort, time, resources, then we decide where we're gonna launch our battle. And we do have to pick our spots. If it's gonna be on the job, then we start talking about programs to make sure that we get folks into the workplace that are representative of the workforce in this city. And we make sure that if one person fails, we don't say, oh, we had one, it didn't work out. It's that, that one missile, remember? <laughs> that one missile went sideways, so we're not gonna try it again. And that we reward people who show that they are serious about bringing and retaining folks into the workplace and promoting them. We always reward the things that we think are important, do the exact same thing. If it's, uh, if it's some other, uh, other area of interest that a person might have, you say housing, whatever, same thing. Get together with people who have information, knowledge, and let's say this is what we're gonna do, and again, there have to be goals. This is how we're gonna measure our success. Next year, there will be at least 200 more units of low-income housing in this community. If it's a bank, next year we commit our bank to either pumping money into 20 existing businesses in the black community, or we will help develop 20 new businesses. Now see, now you're getting serious about business growth and development. That's, I mean, we measure everything else in these institutions, right? We put numbers on them. People's careers <laughs> revolve around those devilish numbers. If that's what we think we're serious about when it comes to uh, racism, we'll do exactly the same thing. Yes, 
Mr. Herndon, I'm Nancy Stanley, a City Club member and with Nationwide Insurance. And we've worked uh, quite a bit the last three or four years uh, with programs. We have employees going into North and Northeast Portland schools. And the things that you're speaking of today are of great concern to us. And also as a member of the Education Standing Committee, we've been working with House Bill 3565. Right. And we have some concerns in terms of education and bringing the bill forward and how diversity will be dealt with in the implementation of the bill. Specifically, could you speak to what the Diversity Council is doing and how you see them supporting uh, dealing with the issues of diversity in the bill? <laughs> this is one of those, those chauffeur jokes. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to make an amusing comment about your, your question. I don't know what the diversity, I don't know who's on the Diversity Council or what they're doing. Uh, so the reason I said it was a chauffeur joke, I'll, I'll tell you this real quick. The guy went around the country, he's, he's a, a general, made speeches about uh, comparing NATO with the Warsaw Pact when it existed and made a, his 100th speech and his, he asked the chauffeur, what do you think of that? And the chauffeur said, hey, I've heard it 100 times, I can give it myself. He said, okay, I got to make one more, let's switch. You put on my uniform, you give the, the speech, I'll be the chauffeur. They did, they got to the place, the chauffeur gave the joke. And someone just like you got up and said, well, General, we'd like to ask you a question. Would you please uh, analyze the, the relative throw weights that exist in the nuclear warheads and the Warsaw Pact and the NATO, and NATO alliance? And the, and the guy stood up and he said, that's a stupid question. <laughs> he, said, he said, that's so doggone stupid, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to answer it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I said, this is one of those chauffeur questions. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but I can, but I can tell you this. This is one of the issues that that we raised with the passage. We, the Black United Front certainly supported passage of the bill. I think that we have to do that. But the question that we raise is, if you don't train teachers any differently, you train them now, there will, the outcomes will be the same. If you have the exact same expectations that an educational system now, that primarily middle class children will succeed, and that is the expectation of them, and that low income children won't succeed, that's exactly what you get regardless of the structure. And we said the exact same thing. If you don't begin to change the way in which you teach children about other cultures and other people, you have the same product. So that concerns me. I'm not aware of their work, but I do know that's, that is an issue. And additionally, we talked about beyond that, the need to make sure that if we are going to have world-class children, a world-class educational system, that you have to change the way in which you're teaching these doggone subjects. You can't teach math the way you've been teaching because in many cases, it's almost irrelevant in today's world. So those are questions we have raised, and probably the biggest one I, that I don't hear getting a lot of attention, all of, the, all of the pressure that is now going to be on principals, if you want to say the manager, the local manager, what kind of training are we going to give them so that they will be able to manage change? I haven't even heard that discussed. I mean, businesses talk about this all the time. We're going to go on to, on to this next level or raise the bar. The person in charge is going to have to retrain. Our expectations are different. What we want them to do is different. And this whole thing about managing chaos, we don't even uh, approach that. So yes, I share. I think your, your concern behind the question, and I hope that it is sincerely addressed. So thank you, chauffeur. Thank you. <laughs> are there other questions from the floor? If not, you're going to have to hear from me. I do have a question, and I encourage others to stand up and ask one, too. In yesterday's uh, edition of the Oregonian, there was a description of some strike at the University of Oregon. A number of minority students are threatening to withdraw from the university. And I know that uh, in recent years, there are the most number of minority students on campus that there have been probably since the late 60s. Um, as many as uh, 2,000 minority students at the U of O. I'm wondering if you could comment on what you see as attitudes on college campuses in Oregon or elsewhere, if you can speak to that, is an issue of simply not enough faculty, minority faculty and administrators, or are there certain attitudes that you see in the college generation today that uh, are surprising to you? Uh, the attitudes are, are not surprising. I think the problem is that because we haven't done the cultural groundwork that for many people, when they see a black face on campus, they assume that they're there because of a special program or that they are an athlete. If they're not an athlete, then you're here because of a special program. And it gets back to expectations again, that the expectation of you is different than it is of other students. And now you add on top of that the other issues that you bring up, faculty, 
programs and do you really want us here? And it seems as if some students, and I'm not that familiar with that situation, but from what little I've seen, it seems as if some students are answering that no, it doesn't appear as if you really want us here. It has to be more than just creating a few scholarships and saying, come on in. We have to make changes in the institution so that they really do begin to accept people who are very different than what the student population looks like currently. Ted Kay, City Club member. Uh, a nomenclature question, uh, or your opinion on nomenclature. We see uh, uh, an evolution in terminology from colored to mm -hmm. Negro to right. black, and now African American. Right. Just wondered uh, what your opinion on, on the subject is. Uh, it's, it's very strange. They say how the more things change, the more they remain the same, that when black people first came to this country as, as chattel slaves, and it's really important if we had time, you need, need to get a good historian up here to, to point out that black people in this country long before Columbus, uh, probably the best book, if you want to read a book on that, is called They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. And even Columbus did write, and this doesn't hit when they talk, talk about Columbus, but he did write that on one of his voyages he passed black men in long boats and they weren't out there by accident. The Indians even told him they were trading with black men in long boats. And they weren't from Brooklyn either, right? These cats, <laughs> and, and these cats had come from Africa, right? So anyway, um, this, is, this is my point. When black folks first came here, they referred to themselves as Africans. And if you look at the first institutions that were established in this country, the first school was called the African Free School. One of the first churches, African Methodist Episcopal Church. So we had no confusion about that initially, but over years, as, the, as the, the cultural warfare became more intense, to rip away the Africanness, you're not an African, whatever happened in Africa is bad, you all were killing each other, you were cannibals, you had no culture, and what you do have here, you should try to eradicate. It began to take hold that these foreign definitions, and if you remember, probably one of the most poignant scenes in Roots was when they finally got the guy to, to call himself Toby. He kept asking, what's your name? What's your name? Stop being Kunta, it ended up being Toby. Well, there are a whole bunch of Tobys in this country today, and we were preceded by a whole bunch of Tobys. The marvelous thing, and this speaks to strength, is that somehow, even in view of that cultural, cultural onslaught, that there always have been black people who have grappled with that question, said, I am not Toby, I am not Toby. That's not my name. My name is not colored. My name is not Negro, even with a capital N, right? That I am first black. I mean, I don't see too many white people who are really white. I look at this piece of paper, this is white, right? That's what they tell oh, oh, you're not black. Damn, you're not white either. <laughs> not what I see. <laughs> but if that's gonna be the working definition, if that's going to be the working definition in this country, then yes, collectively, we are black. Now, if you want to get, become even more specific and more accurate, I think African-American, African, that that's uh, obviously, that is a leap forward. And you talk about all the, all the liabilities in the community, but to think what strength that shows, and in spite of all the turmoil over the decades and centuries, that a group of people have hung on to that, and that's important that we name ourselves, and even in the midst of all this hell and chaos that folks are able to do it? Now, mind you, this is during the era when all the gangs and all the drugs, that this finally takes hold. And the other beautiful thing that's occurred is the, 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 the renewed interest in Malcolm X. This country spent a lot of time trying to deprogram Malcolm X out of consciousness in the black community. Don't believe me, pick up a textbook and see if, how much time is spent studying Martin Luther King and how much time is spent studying Malcolm X. Spent a lot of time saying, no, that's not the kind of leader you want to talk about. But to see that being revived, and we must say, whatever you may want to say about these rap groups, and I probably have as much criticism about some of the lyrics as anybody around, but they are the ones that revived Malcolm X as an important figure in the black community in this country. Those rap groups did it. They were the ones that start wearing the Malcolm X hats, t-shirts. They were the ones that started putting Malcolm X in some of those rap videos. And the amazing thing, these are kids that were not even alive when Malcolm was alive. That speaks to strength in a community. 
that that message is somehow, they sure didn't learn in school, that's for doggone sure, but that a community and a culture has kept alive an important figure that the major society did this to. That's amazing. It, it even shocks me and brings me to tears just to think how that happened. So I think that it's an evolutionary process that, that has occurred, and I think it speaks to strength and something that shows that there are strengths that can be built on. I personally applaud it. It's what's so funny. I remember when I used to live in New York, you were talking about how you get from Kansas to New York to Sierra Leone. Anyway, there's a little button that I got at a black bookstore in 1965 that said, free men name themselves, we are Afro-Americans. So this is not new. This goes all the way. I mean, you can count. This, this battle and debate has raged ever since colored hit the landscape. So round the outhouse response. My name is Matt Morris, and I'm a human resources consultant and also a member of the YWCA Board of Directors. And my question is, how can we as parents begin to educate our children to recognize and oppose institutional racism? Well, I think it's like everything else, that our actions speak louder than words. It's with children, you can tell them anything, but they're going to watch what you do that they really have to see us as adults do it, and we have to give them models. And we have to show, it's, I think it's like teaching any other lesson, that we have to show them there is a reward for doing this, that it may be difficult, and you may not win a lot of friends, and there are times when you will feel isolated, but it truly is the right thing to do. The same thing we try to teach children about why they should stay away from drugs, we tell you the same thing. You might lose friends, you might be at parties and feel isolated. They'll call you a square, unhip, half hip, but it's the right thing to do, and that's why you want to do it. Take that exact same approach about op opposing racism and doing something about it. But they have to see us do it, and we have to show them that there, there are rewards and there are victories to, to be obtained in doing that. Last question, Bill. <clears throat> Bill Connor, City Club member. Uh, black students have gone on strike uh, to protest attitudes of the school system. Uh, could you uh, tell us more in detail what's back of this and what's back of the recent confrontation with the school board? Yes, sir, I can. I think really it's, it's the age-old concern that the educational system work for our children. Education has Historically, education has been highly prized in the black community, and, and many people don't realize this, because several, many of slaves that were brought to this country were doctors, lawyers. I mean, you had several universities in Africa during the height of the slave trade. So learning was not something that was new to Africans. As a matter of fact, back in, I think, about the, the 1100s, 1200s, you hear people talking about Timbuktu. That was one of the learning centers of the world and one Arab uh, historian went to Timbuktu and he said the business that was most thriving in Timbuktu was selling books, books. He's not talking about something on a banana leaf, books. And said that he had one acquaintance who was lamenting the fact that his own personal library only had 9,000 volumes. 9,000 volumes. So education has always been highly prized in the community. If you jump quick to slavery, indication of that is that slaves would risk being beaten and tortured to learn how to read and write. Must prize education to do that. After Civil War, Reconstruction, black people ran to those schools, no matter what age, they ran to those schools to get an education. What you see today and what's been played out over the last, at least here in Portland, last decade or so, is black people saying all of our community dreams, hopes, and aspirations center around our children. Given what we're up against, we know the one institution that we have relied upon in the past to try to improve our circumstances has always been schools, always. When I was a young cat growing up, they always told me, get an education. We want you to be better than we are, but you have to get an education. So we have relied on the educational system to help us gain the skills to keep fighting that fight that you were talking about. I mean, we were told that. We were even told, little kids, during the height of segregation, told us, you're going to have to be twice as good as white boys and white girls. That's what teachers told us. And this wasn't Rap Brown and Angela Davis. These were 
teachers who knew what racism was all about and taught, this is what this is the fight you're up against but you're going to have to be good at this what we find is an educational system that isn't working for our children hasn't been working for our children you go through these, these boycotts strikes you think you have agreements and specifically in this one put together as a way to resolve the issues raised during the last boycott a, a citywide panel committee city club served on it I was looking at one of my friends uh, Eva Parsons was on it uh, people from all over the city get together and say okay here are the plans that both contending parties have we think they can be melded together into something that's going to work for all of our children this is what needs to occur in terms of, of educational reform to make a long story short one part of the plan talked about site-based councils that means the decision making being driven down to the school level for input from parents community people to talk about what we're going to do to improve student outcomes. That's the only thing we're concerned about, student outcomes, and that they go up. And we'll all be involved in that discussion and in that decision making. That was in the plan. House, the education reform bill that passed, unfortunately, said that 51% of those councils should be teachers. We recognize that and said to the school district, there is also s legislation that says that you can ask for a waiver of any of these laws and statutes if you think it's going to help. We said, look, you can't any longer have these junior-senior partner relationships in which one party has more votes than the other. If you really want a collaborative relationship, let's truly say we're all in it together. Ask for a waiver of that requirement. And some people say they weren't aware of that. All you have to do is get a videotape that we have, and it was done by Paragon with Dr. Prophet last spring, in which that was said. And he said he would look into it, OK? So we go through this. We'd ask for the waiver. No report back from the district. And Dr. Prophet was representing the board at that time. No report back on the waiver. No report back on these other issues. Finally, we are preparing. This is strange. We are preparing to try to bring together a citywide coalition of people to see if we can begin to implement some of these ideas about educational reform, help parents. We were talking about setting up a parent hotline so if parents had concerns, they could get questions answered. We're going to start an off-the-tube campaign to encourage parents to turn off the tube, the television, and limit real rah-rah campaign to get us all involved. And we say, hey, where is the district on some of these issues? So we politely wrote a letter and said, where are you on site councils? We get back an ambiguous response. And that sent my antenna up, right? then find out that after we've gone through all this that they sign a contract with the teachers union that says three things one that all of the meetings this is signed i asked dr De beerworth the other day i said is, has that contract been signed he said yes i said is this language in it he said yes all of the meetings have to occur during school hours so much for one to be involved parents right since I tell you, said most of these parents out here working one job, two job, hustling to try to keep body and soul together, but we pay the salary, we, we pay the bill, but you tell the public, if you want to come to a meeting, come during school hours. That's no debate. That's the language, black and white. Two, if the council, mind you, waivers were never requested. From what I've been able to determine, they were never requested. If the council makes a decision, 25%, 25% of the teachers in that building, if they don't like it, they can ask that everybody in the building vote on it. And guess what? It takes two-thirds majority to sustain the decision. Now, I'll repeat this. That means that out of 100 people, 34 people can block any decision that this powerful site council has made. That's in the language. And you know what they tell us? Oh, don't be concerned about the language. Don't be concerned about ratios. Somebody was concerned enough that they put in a doggone contract. I'm not the one to give lectures on not being concerned about language and numbers, and especially since you signed a contract. And especially, you know, talking to people who've had language, talking about three-fifths of a man and can't vote, and you tell us, don't be concerned about a contract. Contracts written like that, I think, speak to insecurity and fear. So that's, that's where we are on that. And our suggestion on, in terms of resolution, one, go back and rewrite the contract. And all we wanted was simple, that everybody have an equal voice. We didn't say parents should run it. We said equal voice. That's it. Equal decision making. 
go back, rewrite the contract. I doubt that they'll do it. And what we're doing now is seeing if we can get some legislation passed in Salem that says simply that parents and teachers will have equal representation. And let each group decide how they want to choose their members. Simple. And please, God, if you want parent involvement, it can't be during the working day. And I swear, that's what it says in the contract. Meetings will be held during the working day and work week. That knocks out the weekend. So you can understand our little emotional outbursts. And then you, and then what we said, and then you turn around and ask parents, to be glorified flunkies, go down to Salem and raise money, right? Train them to go raise money for the school system. But when it comes to making decisions about their children, you're outvoted. And even if you do slip something through, we got this in our hip pocket. We got the joker in the deck that we can play on you. 25% of the people, three-fourths, two-thirds of the people have to approve this. 